Oh, if you look, um, actually, I can I can bring up a picture that I'm in. Yeah, my brother mentioned it too. Right. Ah. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and Romney's actually at the place where my dad worked for 30 years, maybe. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So before we begin, yeah, here's my, my brush with greatness. And uh, my daughter said, look, there's Santa Claus in the audience. So she's pretty funny. Yeah, it cracks me up. Are you on the front? No, 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 no. Um, I'm pretty pretty far in the back. But you, you definitely can see me. In fact, in, in the particular picture, um, Actually, I'm probably, uh, the, the, I think they were in, uh, intentionally going for a shot of the crowd because uh, the, actually the president is blurry and the crowd is clear. Either that or they misfocused it. But here we go. Uh, that's me right there. Oh, okay. In fact, I tagged myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's Zellers and there's Obama in case anyone's wondering. Everyone else, I don't know who they are, but you know, I did. Started at two thirty because yeah, we were out right around two thirty. Yesterday, oh, okay. My son is driving, and I said, "Oh yeah, we're going to spend time because we see all the cops around." Right. Okay, let's let's go drive down. At the right. Abbey. One of my students, one of my students, actually got pictures of his motorcade, and he said it was flying down down Abbey Road, and but you actually can see the president through the glass, which I, you know, I would have thought the glass would have been. Yeah. Well, it was tinted, and it was pretty heavily tinted, but you definitely can see him him through the through the glass. So, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Right, right, right. Like what he did. Right, right, right. Yeah, he, he went he went to some restaurant in Illyria the last time he was here. I forget, but he did meet. He actually met one. He met with four LC students, one of which was my friend from high school, which I didn't even know until after after the fact. Uh, uh, and I I heard him mention a name. I heard him mention the name Dwayne, and you know, but you know, it's a kind of common name. You know, I mean, it's not that unusual. And then. Later on, my brother told me that he, he saw on, on TV, and it's like, oh my God. So I went back and looked at the picture. Sure enough, in the background, you can see him. And then there's a picture on the White House uh, website of the president meeting with four LC students, him being one of them, which, which was kind of good. We're at the time where the focus ought to be on getting everything done and finished. All right? Um, you know professors. If you give us time, we can fill it up with something. All right, <laughs> you know, if we have an hour to talk, we can talk. We can talk probably an hour and a half, right? So it's not as though I don't have things that I would like to cover or even could cover. It's a case of where our priorities are, and and I think it's important for us to to look at where you are as far as the last assignment goes or the last couple assignments, depending on where you are. I kind of lost track of of where everyone is. Um, and also look at uh, for your final project. All right. What I'd like to do is bring up the specifications for the last lab. Would that be a good starting point, or do we want to go to the one before that? that would be good for me. The one before oh, the, last. the last one. Okay. Or do we want to go back to eight? Okay. Okay. All right. Issue on the 
So what I want to do is go over and kind of like talk through some of the key points. And if there's anything in particular you want to see demonstrated, let me know because we can go over that. And then I want to spend some time talking about the project so in case there's specific questions you can have. And then, then we'll break for lab. All righty. Let's pull up lab nine, you said? Oh, okay. Okay. Sure, we can look at eight. If we don't have any questions, we don't have any questions. All right, we can, but we can look at it. All right. Um, lab eight. Make the changes to the lab for lab seven. All right. Uh, and lab seven was where you had uh, the, the ability to select a, uh, a group of automobiles by model and then you, you displayed the picture of the model, and then you had a link to go to the details of, of the car. All right? And this one was to change the details view so that we can go right into edit mode for the details view and change the grid view so that we can update and delete. All right? Um, so in other words, it should look something like this. We have our drop down on the search page where you pick the model of the car. You get a list of cars. One of the columns is the link. All right. I don't know what's going on with this. One of the columns is a link. When you click on it, the details page the grid view, I'm sorry, the details view should already be in edit mode. And where possible, change from the default of text boxes to drop downs, put validation where needed, and so on. And there should be an update or a cancel. And then you have the grid view, and the grid view should be enabled for edit and delete. And again, certain things you might need a drop down for or validation or whatever on those. The key thing for this and the, the mistake, and I think I've talked to a few people about this, but, but the one big issue of this is your life will be a lot easier if each of these, if, if each of the SQL statements behind these details view and grid view is based only on one table. All right? That simplifies your life a lot. Now you might say, but I need more than one table. Well, you kind of do, but you kind of don't. All right? For example, if you pull up the details for an automobile, you might have the automobile ID and the serial number and the state and the plate. And one of the attributes might be the model ID. Now you might be tempted to say, well, I need the model table then. All right? I need the model table because the model table um, uh, you know, contains the name of the model. I don't want to show that, that it's model 5. I want to show that it's an eclipse or a focus or whatever. Well, in reality, you don't need the model table as part of the details view. You can make the model ID and you'll need the model ID as a column in the details view. But then you change it so that you make it a template column and the model ID then, instead of having a text box for it, you make it so that it's a drop down. And if you're really struggling for it, what I would suggest to do first is get your edits and, and, and edits and deletes working without a nice looking GUI. All right, get it working without going in and adding the validation and um, adding drop downs and so on and so forth. Then once you get that working, then go and add those additional features on. All right, but that's sort of the key place where people kind of kind of get off track is 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 they think, well, I want to display the model, so I need to use the model table. Actually, not. You can still display. You can still have in your data source the model ID. And then just through the making of a template column, you can make a drop down. Now, as far as um, 
a, a column that's not in edit mode, you know, you don't want a drop down for that, that that they can change, but you can always disable that drop down so that they can view it, but they can't edit it. So that's that's a neat little trick with that. Generally speaking, that's the big thing. Remember to add validation. Remember to trap for errors in case something goes wrong. All right. And you probably, if they've clicked cancel or if they've successfully updated, probably want to navigate back to the search page. All right. So after they've updated this, now after they've updated a, a, a maintenance item, you can stay on that page. But after they've updated the car, you can go back. Or, or not, I, I guess. You could, you could make it so that you had to click a link to go back. Uh, that would be acceptable as well. But probably the better way in my mind is after you click update, it goes back. Questions, problem spots, etc. on that one. Is there anything in particular that's holding you up on that, or? I don't understand what to do, but it's just not. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll take a look in lab. If you don't have a specific question now, you you might very well, you know, you can spend the time in lab, and we'll look to see if you have. Yesterday, everything is okay. Uh huh. Are you able to see do what needs to be right. done? Okay. Right. My detail is okay. Right. But I'm having problems with my grid view. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my grid view is working. Well, that's not bad. <laughs> so it got better, you know. It got better, but I'm right. adding now the uh, validation in my grid Okay. View, all right. What's going on? Right? Yeah. Well, we can, we can take a look at that if you have specific questions. Lab 9. Let's look at that one. Well, That'll be good then. We can kind of talk through some of the most uh, important points to it. All right. Create a form of your own that will, that will allow you to add a maintenance record for a car. And I suggest don't use a details view. That suggestion is made largely for your sanity, all right? Because it's a lot easier to do this one without making a details view, at least in my opinion, all right? You should be able to access the form from the car's detail page. You should be access the form from the car's detail page. Oh, okay. So either put that code, either put that form on the page itself or have a link to a page. So in other words, if you want, you can have on this page a form to add a new um, details row right on the same page as the details, or you can have a link that would take you to another page that has a form to add a details. Right. But I would suggest that you don't use a details view. Here's why. All right, let's think about this. I don't know exactly what your table is called, but I would imagine your table all right, has at least three fields in it. Your, your maintenance table has at least three fields in it. It probably has a auto ID of sorts something that's the primary key of the auto table. It has a service um, ID. And it has a date that it was performed. Now you might have other things, but at the very least you would need that in your table. All right. Now, let's think about this. <coughs> The automobile, we don't want the user to have to enter the automobile on this form, right? They should already know the automobile, right? If they're on this page, it's this car. They shouldn't have to go in a drop down and pick that car again, all right? 
it should automatically default to that car ID. All right? That's one reason that I'm suggesting custom coding this, because this isn't a conventional form where you're filling in all the fields. Some of the fields are coming from somewhere else. All right? Namely, the automobile is coming from the automobile that's associated with the query string. So, I would, so, so you don't even really need on this form to show the automobile ID. Or I'm sorry, to allow them to edit the automobile ID. You could show it to let them know what car they're adding it for, but you don't really need to allow them to edit the automobile ID. All right? Service ID and date performed, those will be two things that will be entered. This has to be a date or a date time, depending on how you do it. The service ID should be a drop down. All right. And we know how to do drop downs, so we know how to bind drop downs to a data source. So that should come from the list of services that are possible. All right. Now, the date should default to the current date. That's one thing. And the service performed should default to the last service that I keyed in. So if I entered in an oil change for the first car and I go in to add another service, even if several pages have gone in between, even if I've gone back to the search page and, and searched for a different model and, and viewed the details of it and goes, goes, go into it, it should default to the service type of, of the last service record that I entered in that browser session. All right. So, all three of the fields get defaulted from somewhere. The date field gets defaulted from the current date. Of course, you can change it. The service uh, type field or, or perf you know, service perf uh, perform field gets populated from the last one that's selected. All right? Yes? Is it the last one selected for that particular car? No, for, for any car. It doesn't matter. Like, let's imagine, again, let's imagine I run a fleet of cars. I might take 10 of them in for an oil change, all right? So that would just make it easy for my life if I was the, the, the office manager to go in, oil change for the first car, then second car, oil change, third one, oil change. And that, that might, might make my life easier, all right? Now, let's think about this again. What's our form going to look like? Our form is going to have... It probably will show the automobile, although you won't necessarily be able to edit it. But it will have a drop down for the service performed. It'll have a text box for the date. And all three of these get defaulted from somewhere. The car ID comes from the query string. And we shouldn't be allowed to change it. The service performed is the last service that I entered, that I saved something for. And the date defaults to the current date. So all three of those fields get populated initially. All right, you'll never have a, well, other than the very first time you go in it when you haven't already had a service, uh, a service performed, you won't have any time where these fields will be blank. All right. That's one of the reasons I recommend using a custom form for it. Uh, in my mind, you know, how, how does the default behavior work? The default behavior is a nice form where you enter in all the fields. This you're not manually entering in all the fields. You're, some of the fields get filled in based on, again, the particular car that I've chosen. Some of them get filled in with the last one that I've, I've chosen, the last service type I've chosen, and get filled in for the current date. It's possible to do that with a details view, but you know what? I, in my opinion, it makes your life easier since we're deviating from sort of the default behavior. Let's go in and just write this ourselves. So, we, you know, we should have practice making our own forms anyhow. Now's as good of an example as any. All right? This we're getting from the query string. This we're getting from, there's probably an ASP.NET function to return the current date. All right? Where are we going to get the last service performed from? 
from a session variable, right? This isn't going to get passed in on the query string. This isn't going to be something that there's, a, you know, a system function for. We need to remember, and sort of the tip-off that is the session variable is the line in here which says, service performed should default to the last service performed added in the current browser session, even if there's a few other pages visited. So, you know, I, if I add an oil change and I go back to the search page and I search for Ford Focuses, then I decide to search for some other kind of car, then another kind, then another one I pull up and look at the particular car, and then I go back, search for a car, and go to add a service record for it, it should still default to oil change. Now the easiest way to do a mechanism like that, where you remember from page to page to page within a browser session, is to store a session variable. And in this case, there's no issue with storing a session variable here because um, because, um, what was I going to say? Oh, it's, it's just a simple variable. We're not storing a complex object which could be, uh, um, you know, a resource issue. We're just storing a primitive. We're just storing whatever the, the key is to the service table, probably an integer. Yes? So, the first time we would go into this session, yeah. that would not be Right. Either it would be either either you'd add a dummy option at the beginning that says please select service type, or you'd just have it default to the top one of the list, depending on what you thought was a better form design. Now, just as an FYI, what if I wanted it to be between browser sessions? That's one of the things we didn't talk about last time. We talked about um, how to remember things within a browser session. To remember things between browser, browser sessions, we have a couple of possibilities. One possibility is to store it somewhere in a database. All right. For example, Amazon. If I go and start it, I'm pretty sure it works this way anyhow. It's been a while since I ordered anything. But if I go in and I'm at home and I put something in my shopping cart but don't check out, then come in and, and, and log in to Amazon from work and go and look, that item is still on my shopping cart, which implies that it's, it's stored on Amazon server more than likely in a database. It's not a session variable because it's two totally different browser sessions. The other option that it could be, but the fact that in this example I mentioned that there were two computers involved, is it could be stored as a cookie. Uh, cookies are little files that get written to your local client machine with some pieces of information. Um, so for example, if I go log in to Gmail, all right, it will ask me if I want to remember my password. That's effectively asking, do you want me to create a cookie that remembers your user ID and password so next time I don't have to go in and log in. All right? So an alternative way to remember between browser sessions would be to write a cookie. So generally speaking, you write something to a database or you write a cookie. All right. You don't always have the ability to write something to a database if you're talking about someone that's browsing a site anonymously. Right? If I, for example, was shopping, uh, let's say, and I hadn't logged on and it didn't know who I was, it wouldn't be able to store it in a database. All right? So if it was going to remember the card, it would have to remember the card as a cookie. All right. How then are you going to actually do the update? You'll do the update the same way. All right? You will... Um, custom write it. So you'll create your class uh, for your data source, your insert statement. Depending on the kind of key that you have, you might not include the key in the insert if it's an auto-generated key. You populate these fields from your form and then it's probably a good idea to remember the service type because you're going to need that the next time they go in. All right. Last but not least, you're going to want to put some error checking in here so that if there is a problem with the insert, for whatever reason, um, you get a user-friendly error. One thing I suggest with things like this is, remember, the exceptions that we process 
um, could come from circumstances we foresee or circumstances that we don't foresee. For example, not necessarily for this problem, but if you're deleting rows from a table. One potential cause for problem that we can expect is if you try to delete rows from a table where there's related records associated with it. We know that that could be a problem. All right? So we want to catch that exception. But then there's all the other kinds of things that you can't anticipate. Like, for example, um, you know, the database server has crashed in the middle of our operation or anything like that. What I typically do is I write that kind of error catching and, and trapping first so I can test it out, right? For example, if you already have validation for that the date entered is a valid date, the date that service was performed was a valid date, how can you test what happens if you try to update with an invalid date? You can't. You know, if you've made too good a client validation, it's hard then to test your server air trapping. So I usually test the server air trapping first. Once I'm confident it works, then I'll go back and add the client validation. And if possible, I prevent those errors from ever happening. Now you might ask yourself, why even have that server air trapping if you're going to validate it so airtight that errors can't possibly happen? Well, we can only prevent certain kinds of errors. Other sorts of errors we can't, and again, we can't anticipate all of them, but we know we can't prevent those via validation. So we have our error trapping to catch those. But it's a nice little catch-all to test all that stuff first before you start adding the client validation to it. In other words, when we, use a, when we use a grid view and check to see if there's an exception created versus when we use a try-catch, yeah, uh, it, it's just um, with, a, with a grid view because the actual code that doesn't update lives somewhere up in the, the, the .NET framework. So we don't have access to that code to put a try-catch around it. So what we're able to do instead is if there's an error, that error gets sent to that um, item changed event. All right? It gets sent to that in that exception field uh, that's part of the arguments. Then we can see if that exists, and then we can go and handle it. All right? So that's a good point. Um, but yeah, the, the same idea is the same. You're going to run into the same sort of exceptions in either situation. It's just the mechanism will be different. All right? Uh, the try-catch is how you catch and process errors. But again, you have to put the try-catch around a block of code. And if you don't have access to that block of code because it's part of the framework, you can't do that. So what they've done is they've given you a hook into it via that item updated or item inserted or item deleted event so that you can go in and, um, so you can go in and, and, and look for that exception and handle it. Other questions? Now you may not know everything that, you may not know how to do everything in this yet, but do you at least have a sense of how it will work? All right. You'll have code that loads up some of these form controls. All right. Okay. Right. How, how to default it? Well, we did something like that in the one example. Let's, let's see if we can pull it up. I don't remember exactly what we did, but. I think we defaulted to the last faculty rank on an ad. Oh, the, Is that it? The, the drop down list yes. Okay. Yeah. So if we're looking at this, exactly. To do that, to do the um, to do the session variable for. Um, 
that drop down, we need to do two things. First thing we need to do is we need to remember when they go to save it that it's been changed. All right? So part of your code will be when they have saved a maintenance record, you're creating a SQL statement that's going to update or, or actually insert into that table. One of the other things that you'll do in that event is you'll remember the service ID that was selected. So that's the one thing that you have to do. The other thing that you have to do then is when the page displays, you have to populate that drop down with the default value. And let's take a look. Let's take a look at that page. Give me a second to turn the crank on the computer to get it going again. I believe it was this page, this faculty edit page. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry I didn't have that on. Okay. In this case, we didn't default the value from a session variable, the drop down. But what we did do is we defaulted it based on the value that we pulled out of the database. So, in simple terms, this half of the equal sign will look a lot like this. This half is going to look a little different because it's not going to be pulling it from a reader. Since we're doing an insert here, we're not reading the database for an insert, it's going to pull the value from a session variable. Then what we need to do then is when we go and perform the update, somewhere in this method where we click the button, we're going to have to set that session variable to the value of the dropdown. So those two things taken together should be enough to allow you to default that. Questions about that or this assignment in general? Yes? Are all the objects in Visual Studio, can they be converted to templates? Like the not just detailed view items and text boxes and drop down list and all that? Well, keep in mind what it means to be a template field. What it means to be a template field is that we're going to not use the default behavior of a grid view or a details view. All right. If we're not using a grid view or a details view, then there's no template fields, right? There's just text boxes and drop downs and other things that you make. You know what I mean? The idea of a template field is where you take the solution in the framework and you customize it for your situation. In other words, the framework by default, when you go into edit mode on a details view, gives you text boxes for everything. No validation. All right? That typically isn't um, okay in most situations. You want to have some kind of validation, and in, in many situations you don't have all text boxes. You're going to have drop downs or radio buttons or check boxes or whatever. So in that case, you have to go in to the details view or grid view and say, I want to make this a template column. All right. Now, to your other question, sort of the question that I'm kind of hearing behind that is, yeah, I can go in and create a drop down of my own 
not associated with a details view or, or a grid view. I don't have to make it a template column because template columns are only relevant uh, for those things. But then I can go and bind that to a data source. Yeah, you can do that. All right. It's not a template column per se, but you can go and bind that control to, to a data source. Or you can, you know, or, and again, you can write code to, to set the selected value to it. All right. Yes? What page are you looking at? I'm looking at faculty-edit.aspx. And this is from the example called example for 412. If you remember a couple Thursdays back, we had an exercise. I then missed that following Tuesday. And then when I was back on Thursday, we went over. No, we, no that, was on, that was on Tuesday. A week ago, Thursday, we went and did this example. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. The four, the, the example from four twelve. Uh, another way to say it, that's the answers from the activity of four seven. Right. I think. I might be off on my dates, but two two Thursdays ago. All right. Project. What issues are we running into project-wise? You guys are all done. Excellent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> go, go ahead. We're supposed to have one query on there. Yes. I kind of remember from the database class that the idea to do a, a sum or a total of some appropriate number maybe. No, let, let, me, let me pull up the project specifications because that's a good point. Because, again, one thing that you find as a teacher is that you think that you've explained something or that you've expressed it, you know, very clearly. When someone else looks at it and points out to you, what you think is crystal clear, you know, can be interpreted a few different ways. So let me pull up the, the project requirements and, and, and we'll go through that. All right, here's the things that it should contain. All right, a master page. That's cool. Site map page. That's good. Don't forget that. A lot of people forget that one. Um, four pages, each which, four other pages, each which interact with the database. All right. Need to do the following things. And the first one is the one that you're, you're speaking of, and that's do a Query based on a criteria. What do I mean? I mean, what I mean is this. I don't want you to pull, or, or let's put it this way, you can do this on another page, but it won't count for this requirement. I want you to pull data out of the database based on some sort of where clause that filters out. That's what I mean based on some criteria. So for example, if I was doing a library application, Maybe I would allow the user to type in an author name and I'd show all the books for that author. That's a query based on a cri some criteria. All right? So the criteria is author equals Stephen King. All right? And then the query runs based on that. All right? Um, so that's what I mean. I don't want to, for example, see a list of every book in the library. You know, that, that's kind of useless. Um, I want to see some sort of query where you put something in, some criteria in, and it filters out. If you're doing like an online catalog, you might put in a product description, and it'll fill out those things that belong, uh, that, that match that product description. Would yes? Like the Apple. Remember we have an example of Apple from the full database that we have? That is early at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. So 
Right, right, right. It, it, and it, again, it doesn't have to be that specific criteria. You could, for example, put in a date and say, show me every book that was purchased after this date. All right, so it doesn't have to be an approximate match. It could be greater than, less than, equal to, approximately equal to, not equal to. It doesn't matter as long as there's some kind of criteria and you're not simply spitting out every, every row in the database, yeah, or every row that joins to another table, all right? So there, it's filtered some way. That's what I mean based on some criteria. So to your question, uh, your question of including um, like a count or a, a sum or an average or something like that, you could do that, but that's not a requirement. All right. Um, you could do both together. For example, you could say, you, you could do this, getting back like to the library example, you could say, type in an author name and show the number of books that each author has, has published. All right, so it wouldn't show the specific books, it would show the number. You could even do something like, put in a number and show me all the authors that have more than that number of books. All right, but again, I, I do want a criteria involved in there somewhere. All right. Perform inserts, updates, and deletes, the second criteria. That should be straightforward. Notice I don't say how you do them, right? So in other words, you could do them by using a grid view. You could do, do them using a details view. You could have a delete on a grid view, an insert and change on a details view. Or you could write your own forms for all these. It doesn't matter how you do them as long as you do all three. You don't have to have one page that does all three. All right? You could have one page that does one, one page that does the other two, or whatever. Doesn't matter as long as somewhere in your application, I can see an insert work, I can see an update work, and I can see a delete work. All right? And the last thing is to show uh, header detail. And again, what that, that is simply is, is similar to what we've done with the automobile, where we show the details of the automobile and then a listing of all the associated service records. When I talk about header detail, I'm talking about essentially showing a one-to-many relationship, where the header is the one and the detail is the many. So, maybe... You know, and again, you can, come, you can mix and match, combine these things. Maybe I type in an author's name and it shows me that author, detailed information about them, and a list of all the books that they've published. All right? That actually hit two of the criteria, <laughs> right? It would have a search and it would have a header detail. All right? So, again... Um, there, there's, there's nothing in the requirements that say that there's one page has to do this, one page has to do that. For they interact with the database, and you do these three things. Yes? Would an example of a head of detail be like a drop down where you select something and then a the detailed view will show? No. That would, that would be more of an example of one where you're doing a search based on a criteria. Now, what would make that? be a header detail is if you had something like this. If you had a drop down, let's say, of authors, you know, all the authors in your library, and then you were able to pick the author and it showed the details about the author, first name, last name, when they were born, whatever, maybe a picture of them even, and then it showed a listing of all the books that that author wrote. That would be a header detail and it would also be a search. This part of it is just a search, okay? Because it goes and it does a query and populates this details view based on some criteria. Or even if it did the details view, all right? That would be an example of a search. A header detail effectively, you know, Real simplistic way to look at it is a header detail is going to have a details view or something you've written on your own, like a details view, and a grid view, 
or something that you've written on your own that works like a grid view. All right. No, it would be a grid view. Because, again, yeah, header yeah, detail. The would be the detail. Right. And the detail would be the grid view. The header. Yes. Would be the, uh, Header's one, detail is many. Right. So you couldn't use two right. details view. The, the, the header would be the detail view. Right. When we say detail, we're talking about many. All right. Other questions? We will probably do something similar the last couple of days, all right, which is next week, where I will come in here, um, I will solicit any general questions that maybe you want reviewed that you think everyone would, would benefit from, and then we'll adjourn and go up the LAM. Um, there are any number of special topics that you might be interested in. If there's anything in particular that we have not covered or that, that, that you want covered more, please bring it to my attention, email it to me, and, and I should be able to work some time in um, sometime next week. All right? But, I mean, we, for the most part, we've covered the, kind of the, the core topics. Um, in past semesters, I've done things like talked about Ajax, talked more about themes. But in my mind, that's the icing on the cake. And if, if we don't get to that, I'm not heartbroken. Um, it's more important for me um, to, to see you complete the project and work the project all the way through than, than to try to cram in a couple of extra special topics. All right. We'll see you up in lab.